Let's welcome our, our second speaker, is Gonzalo Cruz. Welcome. Thank you. He is um, undertaking his PhD. He's a PhD candidate at the uh, Sibelius Academy in Helsinki. He is bringing us the latest, latest, latest findings since he's been busy up until yesterday as well. So thank you for this fresh and novel information that you bring us. He has been involved, uh, Gonzalo, in the revival process of local ga gaita bagpipes in Portugal by researching, playing, teaching, and building bag pipe bagpipes, as well as maintaining a professional bagpipe making workshop that he has moved now to Helsinki and transformed into a woodwind research lab. Today he's talking about this, one of the topics of his researches, research for growing bagpipes of the Baltic Sea. So thank, thank you, you. And welcome. Thank you all for being here. It's very, it's very exciting and such a pleasure to be in such a beautiful hall and in such a beautiful country that I, I'm visiting for the first time. Although this visit was in the making for two years, but we all know about that, right? What's been happening for the past year. Um, I have quite a few slides. I, I, I'm going to try not to rush them <clears throat> and not to be late. So my main objectives for these lectures are actually to um, disseminate information about bagpipes and to try to break some mis mis misconceptions, common mis misconceptions. Also spark your imagination, foster discussion, share ongoing international research. And of course, ask for the Academy support, for your support and for your criticism. So what am I doing here and how does a Portuguese guy end up in Helsinki and now in Latvia? Uh, worried about bagpipes of the Baltic. So on the left, that's me with hair. Um, in 1998, uh, I was uh, applying for architectural school and I fell in love with bagpipes and I have absolutely no explanation because the bagpipe revival in Portugal started maybe three or four years afterwards. So something was already in the air and our generation, my generation, people my age got really excited about it. So from then until now, um, bagpipes were my hobby and I was to become an architect and architecture became a hobby and I decided to become uh, a folk musician and a, and a maker and everything happened at the same time. So the Finnish adventure, um, <laughs> it's like an 80s joke, right? I, I, met, I met another bagpiper at the bar and he was Finnish. It was Petri Prauda from the Sibelius Academy and it was in Budapest. And, uh, and he told me about the Finnish bagpipe, which is something I never heard about, for good reason, you'll understand why. And I, I, I was intrigued. Um, so a little, a little bit naively, I, I moved in 2019, even before knowing that I had been accepted. I applied and then I moved. I applied to the Sibelius Academy. Why the Sibelius Academy? <laughs> because in my country, and we were discussing that about Italy, it's probably something about the southern countries. Um, there is no folk department. We have early music, jazz, and classical music. Um, and the Sibelius Academy has a booming folk music department, which in my opinion is very forward looking. That's why they took a crazy guy like me, I guess. So they have similar research for the, for the cantele and for the yohiko, um, both in performance, and um, especially in the Yohiko, the redesign and reconstruction of the uh, Finnish Yohiko. On the right, it's uh, who end up being my supervisor, Kristina Ilmonen, that is also ex uh, ex working on this exciting new field of woodwinds in Finland, which is something also to be reconstructed. Um, so I arrived, I immediately made a website. Um, I called it Find It or Find It, and it was very easy, we just find the bagpipe, build it and play it. Easier said than done, of course. I started doing what I call network, uh, bagpipe network meetings. We did one in 2019, then nothing, and another one just a few months ago. The first one, we had bagpipers from Latvia and, uh, and Liane Barbo from Estonia telling us about the Latvian and Estonian bagpipes. It was, uh, for me, it was like having the state of the art, the literature review coming to, to, my, to, my home, to my hometown, what is now my hometown, Helsinki. And recently we had uh, Barnaby Brown from Scotland, Simon Waters, Northern Ireland. We had Szechuan Kiao, which is here with me. Uh, we had 
Ulrich Morgenstern from Vienna, and all excited about uh, early periods of instruments and bagpipes. So that's more or less the context. I hope I'm on time. Before we continue, I want to ask you to, to share with me a, an exper an ex a certain of an experiment. You know about mindfulness? Just want you to relax and imagine in your minds a bagpiper. Okay, and the bagpiper. Ready, calm, breathing. Okay, probably that was it, right? Please don't lie. So, in your mind, you have this sound, right? Okay, so I want you to let go a little bit of this and open yourselves for a more diverse wo world of sounds and looks. So, around the world, bagpipes are all different and all the same, just like people. The pipers are a large group of, of practitioners that for the most part, in my experience, do not care about race, nationality, religious belief. As long as your reed instrument is attached to a bag, you are part of the clan. So it's the musical instruments itself that foster familiarity, compassion, understanding, and becomes a bridge. Around the world, the history of bagpipes is one of survival, extinction, or revival. Okay, this is the last bagpipe sound that we will hear today. Um, for the remaining 20 minutes, we'll have musical silence. And why? Because the bagpipes that I want to tell you about have been forgotten. Um, I normally play one of these revival bagpipes, but I started wondering if that is not a disservice to the, my field of research because I, I really want us all to understand that what the instruments we are talking about um, has, have been silent for over 100 years. We don't know how they sound, okay? So, I'm a musician, and uh, at the core of my research, of course, it's, is, is the sound of the instruments, but what do we do when the instruments go silent? So, surely uh, we can't uh, no amount of thinking about it will solve the issue. No amount of creativity. We need design thinking. We need problem solving. We need experimentation. We need to do prototyping. We need to, to do drawings, measurements. We have to know about material science. In short, it, it takes an opening of the field uh, of research. It takes a necessarily a different approach and we need to expand the range of tools, skills, and experiences, both, both background of the researcher, past experience, like in my case, architecture, and experimentation. And of course, it takes a musician to make sense of the data, and hopefully, when we have all of that in the same person, it's great. So, um, Pipers are a group of practitioners uh, that share knowledge, knowledge, skill, practices, models of understanding that are mostly unpublished. So let's call that tacit knowledge, um, a sort of organically established consensus based on trial and error. We have also to understand that bagpipes have intrinsic boundaries, um, articulation, temperament, range, but those limitations, those boundaries, are embraced by the practitioners and explored artistically. I cannot stress this enough. It takes a bagpiper to fully understand the bagpipe. We cannot intellectualize it, rationalize it. It doesn't work. We have to feel it and experience it. It takes an instrument to create a musician. So, if the bagpipe is my teacher, which in my case it was because I'm self-taught, um, we need an object and we need a, we need a practitioner and we feed from each other, right? If there is no object, there is no practitioner. And that's how things go extinct. So how do we break this cycle? If there's a maker, if there's a designer or researcher, 
that puts forward an object that the practitioner can experiment with and feedback information to the maker and so on. And then the cycle, it's like a startup engine. So, Finland. Finland had an extinction process. And I must be, make this clear again. Survival, extinction or revival. Most of Europe had, has had revival processes that are rather long and how we, now we are look, looking, analyzing the revival itself. But in other, in other countries as, as the Baltic, revival is ongoing. So, Extinction occur na occurs na na normally in the 19th century, depending on the instruments. But in Finland, apparently it happened a long time ago because the remaining, the remaining part we have was found in an archaeological dig, dig in the city of Turku. And the archaeologists have dated positively as being 1396. So Finns have something that the world normally doesn't have, a medieval piece of a backpipe. And this is a piece of the, of the drone. Of course, uh, my experience is extremely positive with museums, has been, although there are horror stories, but they were super open. I got full access to the object. Of course, I measured it. What architects and designers do, you measure it, you document it, you draw it, and then you make it, because I'm a bagpipe maker. Making uh, wood, uh, woodwinds or bagpipes in the uh, common uh, practice is a subtraction process. It's time consuming and it gives you a high quality instrument but the, the, the labor is, is, is costly, right? And also there's a lot of, of um, from an ecology standpoint, we are also, uh, to make prototypes, we are um, uh, wasting a lot of wood. So we went from one, uh, roughly 400 to 2019, and we have a working prototype. You, uh, you, can, you can see it online. <laughs> I actually played in one of the uh, presentations. I didn't bring it this time. So Estonia. I had the amazing time in Estonia. Uh, I was helped by Leanne Barbo, which she, she's a piper, dancer, and teacher at Tallinn. And she just opened all the doors of the museums for us. It was unbelievable. We visit three museums, one in the islands. We measure a dozen instruments and what instruments they have in the museums. Again, uh, we haven't heard these instruments. I was expecting to find one bagpipe in Estonia, as you can see, when you start putting the objects, which is a privilege to have all the objects at the same time in the museum, because in some museums you get one object back in the box, one object back in the box. When, when they allow us, like they did in Latvia, Estonia, um, to have all the instruments at the same time, you can do this. And then it immediately becomes apparent, you know, you have two pitches, two sides, instruments, chanters, and in two different systems. So there's two bagpipes to hear, at least, um, at least in Estonia. Again, we do measurements, but this time I had a secret weapon. You'll know more about it. So by precise measurement of the inside of the instrument and outside of the instrument, we don't have computer tomography available, of course, in the museums because it's costly, so we do it manually, but we can get a, a great degree of precision. And then we model it. And once you have a model, you can make uh, simulations of uh, airflow. You can have technical drawings back uh, at you. And now you can clearly, oh, it doesn't, you, you can't really tell us, but you can do something virtually which you can't in the museum, which is to cut the object in, in sections. Now that we have a, a perfect 3D model, we can print as much models as um, as we can. I left my models in my backpack. Sejran, can you hand me those things? On the inside, on the other one. Yeah. It's, a, it's too bad. It, there's, there's a little different session on this. In the middle one. But we have time. No worries. I'll show you in, a, in, in time. 
So, Latvia. Yes, thank you. Uh, I came to Latvia one, one, almost, almost one week in advance. I came, I came on Monday because there was a lot to do in Latvia. This is already, already a photograph from the, from the museum. Uh, these are perfect replicas of the pictures I showed before. Okay, so now I can, it takes five hours to print each. I print it, I send it to Liane, I send it to Anders Norud in, 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 um, in uh, Sweden, I send to the Latvian Pipers, and now we start to have a discussion. So, Latvia. The place where there are no bagpipes. I came on Monday and I was extremely lucky because Krishna Nagaraja that you already know from the Spells Academy uh, was kind enough to come also with me in advance. And Szechuan is a PhD researcher from Queen's University in, um, in Belfast. He's doing a similar research on the border pipes of the lowlands of Scotland. So, three people measured 16 bagpipes, fully documented and fully um, measured. This is hand notes, but this will all become models like this. And we can get extreme in our measurements if we really want uh, exact replicas, even of the parts of the instrument that are not functional, but they are aesthetical. Um, again, I, I couldn't have been uh, more welcome at the museum. Making phone calls for us, showing us books, uh, calling other museums, you know, we have bagpipes, but there are two more bagpipes in another museum I could call for you. Um, we used, uh, we are already improving our um, methods to become faster and faster. One thing that we don't have, we have this, this top scanner that I'll show you and we take pictures and we use computers, but we don't go around the airport and Ryanair with the big flat pad scanner. They had the most amazing flatbed scanner that when me and Sashman left, we said we have to buy one. It's 4,000 euros, we're not gonna buy one. Um, but look, uh, it's perfect at scale uh, pictures of the instrument. We can, we can rely on that, we can just measure from that. There's no parallax, no, no, no deformation. Okay, so again, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket science scientists, right? We have very old instruments, which if, if I wouldn't mind saying it's 18th century, 17th century. Then we have people trying to reproduce that more crudely. Then we have second type of drones, and then someone reproducing that. Right? So, Yanis was showing me around ethnography collection, and I go like, is that a is that a shelf full of drones? It can't be, and it wasn't. So, it will surprise you to, to know that the three ones on the left are bagpipes. The three ones on the right are, what's the English norm, name, pestle? Pestle, you know what a pestle is? I didn't know the English name, pestle and mortar. It's something you use to squash or grind materials to a, to a pulp to a powder, okay? So, who makes the bagpipes? Because there is the myth, each bagpiper made its own bagpipe, and only shepherds play the bagpipes, and it's nonsense. You, had, you, you saw the lathe turning and the, me doing the bagpipe. That takes skill. So when there, is, there are no more bag, bagpipe makers, when there are no more instrument makers, the instruments start to decline and people that want to maintain their instruments start to have a frank, what we call a Frankenstein instrument, which is every time you find that, which is old pieces with new pieces. So it's, it's safe to assume that people that made everyday life objects, when asked, would make a piece for a bagpipe. 
So we have to go as further back to get the nice quality instruments and the nice sound. What's next? Sweden. So me and Szechuan on Monday are going to Sweden and looking at Swedish bagpipes. This question of, of identity is also something to be discussed. So, some hopes that we can establish further networks and institutional cooperation, like the one that Sibelius Academy is striking with the uh, SARC, Sonic, uh, Sonic Arcs Research Center at the Queen's University of Belfast. Through the PhD candidates, me and Szechuan, we, we are, have so much in common that two institutions came together because of us. Stronger links between bagpipe researchers and other, other uh, mus uh, musical instrument studies researchers and practitioners, and of, of course academic bridges beyond established thinking. Because I think, I, I hope I have demonstrated that um, silos of knowledge uh, are not good, I guess. <laughs> I have demonstrated that. Um, and let's all try to search for knowledge wherever it is. Because in Pipers, the knowledge is not inside the academias, it's with the practitioners. And many of those practitioners have no interest in the academia. So we have to be compassionate and kind, and they have to be compassionate and, and patient with all of us. Those are my websites, and I hope I kept my timing. Thank you, thank you so much. I, of course, I, I welcome all your questions and, and critique. Yeah, thank you, Walter. Thank you. Your, your dedication and your passion is very uh, It's marvelous. craziness, you can. Yeah, and you your can. craziness. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's madness. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's something to admire, this dedication. Thank very you. inspiring. Okay. As he said, he's very welcome to take questions. And you have bagpipes. Yes, and the sound. Yes. The dance is very special. There, there are, uh, for example, in my country, I think one of the reasons the bagpipe may have survived is, is exactly the dances. There is a particular set of dances that, uh, that, in fact, that kind of dances exist elsewhere, different genres, but it's uh, kind of a sword dance or dance with sticks. Uh, and it can only be danced to the sound of the bagpipes. Uh, and each, so they call it gasus, it's ancient Portuguese dialect. Um, and each dance is a script, and the music uh, is very, uh, script very canonical almost. And the percussion uh, is also a script to that particular tune. So, so everything is. is very uh, classical, let's say, and the dances have to do, be done very precisely because it's militaristic almost. It's normally eight men. Um, they have names for each of the positions, pawns and so on, and they, they have to repeat it four times in the four directions. It's, it's amazing. So that's bagpipe music. I'm, I'm sure that exists all around the world. I was, I was actually wondering, um, well, of course, one has the curiosity of, of hearing how it sounds, but leaving that, side, uh, that topic aside, mm -hmm. what about the repertoire? What would these instruments play and where is yeah. it to be found? Yeah, so the acoustic, uh, uh, people keep saying, well, it's not a limitation. I'll use this time, I'll use the word limitation. The, the, the limitations of range, the boundaries of, of the fact that there is a drone present, so the drone has a certain length, so the drone, will be a, a, a particular note in our scale. All of those are like a DNA. So once you can, through the evidence, establish that DNA, then when you look at repertoire, you say, well, doesn't fit, doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. It fits, it may be a bagpipe tune. And that has been happening with revivals of extinct instruments. But uh, as you saw with the images of bagpipes, bagpipes are just the same idea assembled by a different monkey. That's what it is around the world. 
different ideas of the same main concept, which is I have a, a reed instrument and I don't want to blow, and I, now I can have like this continuous sound and I can even sing. So I wouldn't worry so much if we don't have the repertoire, because I guarantee that if enough time passes, we'll come up with the almost exact same repertoire. <laughs> Not the exact same repertoire, but, but something very close. And, and that has also is something that I think the Spellers Academy is also uh, is uh, this notion that they have in the folk department of, of the practitioner um, walking a road walked before without knowing that he or she is walking that road and um, come up with the yeah. evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Are there any other questions from the hall? You said that you were collaborating with Latvian bagpipers, but you didn't give any name. Who were those bagpipers? Yes, because I'm awful with names. And special last names. It's Yuris and Uldis from the Sweet Tea region. They are folklorists and and, uh, and, uh, and very interesting people that have have been attempting to play and uh, and uh, reconstruct the instrument. So when we met, uh, from from me and from us, they can have everything, and uh, we share all the information because there is no point on reinventing the wheel. Um, so so this is the first step. Now they will get all the measurements from the old instruments so they can reproduce accurately. Until now, it was more of a creative process of trying to reinvent tradition. Any other questions? Thank you, Gonzalo. I'll be brief. Uh, there's many, many concepts that you, you talk always managed to bring on in my uh, very lazy, otherwise lazy mind. Like, <laughs> uh, it perspires uh, from every little corner of your research. Necessity, or not? Um, how do you say that in English? The necessity, yeah. The necessity of an interdisciplinary approach to research, mm. uh, which I find really, really enlightening. So thanks for bringing that to the discussion. I am actually intrigued by a very, very small um, line, like a very, very tiny line in this last slide, which is help your own culture by helping Finnish culture. Uh -huh. Can you, it's, well, uh, can you I, elaborate on that? I, this is being recorded and, and I, 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 might, I might mess up the, even the citation, but I believe there is this African concept. I, I apologize if I'm making this up. I think it's Ubuntu. And, and it has more or less to see that uh, I exist because you exist. So in a sense, in you I see myself. And, and that was, is this idea that I tried to convey in the beginning. We are all absolutely different. And we are all absolutely the same. So the only way for me to understand my culture and to understand myself is to, to somehow try to see myself in the other, how much, how, how much different he might be. Because, but that difference actually um, creates a silhouette, uh, uh, gives more contrast to myself in a way. So my path was, I think I've learned more about being Portuguese by being three years in Finland than I ever had uh, 40 years in Portugal. Um, so I think that's what I meant, help your own culture by helping Finnish culture. Jorge Drexel, I'm going to mess up the quote as well, but yeah. it kind of reflects we, we, on that. Yeah. It's only friends. <laughs> like, we are from everywhere a little bit and yeah. from nowhere at all. Yeah. 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 I have the feeling this conversation could go on for a very long time, but we're running out of time, yes. so let's Thank welcome you. the next presenter and Thank let's you. use the coffee break to go further on those ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gonzalo. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.